Good afternoon, everybody. Look at this audience. This room is packed. Six months ago, when the ASPC committee sat around the table and deciding what type of presidential symposium was going to be presented in 2013, I had a couple of ideas. We trashed one, we trashed this one, and we thought about a very important topic. And uh, I can see by the nature of all the group in this room, everybody seems ready to go. Uh, and this is a hot topic, and I'm glad you're all here. Again, welcome to this year's Presidential Symposium on New Dental Workforce Models. As I said earlier, when this topic was first proposed in our planning meetings, we joked that we might need to hire referees. I don't need to tell you that people in dental education are very passionate about this issue. It's been a topic of discussion for the IDEA Board of Directors for many, many years. More importantly, about a dozen state legislatures, several major philanthropies, and many of our member institutions are actively grappling, grappling with the role of emerging models of care in addressing and concerning access. IDEA has not taken a position on the models themselves and what role they should play in solving the problem of insufficient access. Nevertheless, we have an investment in seeing that the entire oral health care workforce is well educated and able to collaborate across the health care team. This brings me to the question we all discuss here today. What are the responsibilities of dental education in preparing new dental workforce models when they are accepted by the states? We are privileged to have two eminent guests with us to offer some answers. Dr. Tyrone Rodriguez, a pediatric dentist, is president-elect of the Hispanic Dental Association and a fellow of the ADA Diversity Leadership Institute. And Dr. Louis Sullivan, former secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is chairman of the Sullivan Alliance to Transform America's Health Professions and founding dean of the Morehouse School of Medicine. We also have assembled a distinguished panel to respond to the remarks. To guide what is sure to be a lively discussion, we have engaged a highly respected journalist who has been observing the evolution of healthcare in the United States and abroad for many years. Susan Denser is likely known to many of you as the editor-in-chief of, Chief of Health Affairs, the nation's leading peer-reviewed journal focused on the intersection of health, healthcare, and health policy. Many of you will also recognize her as a regular analyst with the PBS NewsHour. In addition to serving on numerous boards, she is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, the health arm of the National Academy of Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Susan Denser. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Denser, Dr. Rodriguez, and Dr. Sullivan, thank you for such an engaging, provocative discussion. Okay? Thank you so much, Jerry, and good afternoon to all of you. It's a real uh, special, special pleasure to be here with you at IDEA. Uh, I think you can see I got a great big, uh, very healthy smile on my face to be with you. I could use a little help on the whitening side. Maybe some of you could uh, direct me to some assistance there. But it is a real pleasure to be here with a group that is thinking so seriously now about the evolution of the dental health care delivery system and its role in shaping the educational uh, future of that, of that system. And as Jerry said, we have two uh, just terrific uh, discussants here to help us uh, navigate their way through that. Because it was a pr presidential symposium, we picked someone who's worked very closely with the President of the United States in the form of Dr. Sullivan, and of course, uh, Dr. Rodriguez also with his uh, work with the Hispanic Association, as well as his work with uh, federally qualified health centers, the safety net system, uh, work both in private practice as well as in the safety net setting, brings a very rich perspective to this as well. So let me give you a sense of how we will proceed today. Uh, I'm going to ask each of these gentlemen to give us some opening thoughts on both sides of this perspective. Is it appropriate now to think about uh, new types of 
dental health providers, uh, mid-level or other uh, non-dentist forms of providers continue to uh, explore that realm further, uh, or is it not? And what is, as, uh, as Jerry said very importantly, what is the role of the educational enterprise in thinking through these new models and shaping these new models. We're going to begin with uh, several minutes uh, from Dr. Sullivan as he will lay out his perspective. We'll then hear several minutes from Tyrone, Dr. Rodriguez, as he lays out his perspective. We'll engage in a little bit of discussion among ourselves. We will take written questions from uh, those of you in the audience. You have, I believe, a uh, paper in front of you to submit those questions. Uh, and at that point, after engaging in some of the uh, questions that come forward from the audience, we will move to bring on our respondents to enlarge the conversation and have an even richer discussion uh, at that point. So with that, Dr. Sullivan, let me start with you, if I might. What, in your view, is the case for new delivery uh, system models of, in dental delivery, the role of new types of providers, why is that something that should move forward? Well, first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with all of you, and I want to congratulate ADEA in having this program. And certainly, it's always a pleasure to be in the uh, company of Susan Denser. I usually see her on television on PBA, PBS uh, programs, and certainly with Tyrone, um, uh, whom I've met, I've really been educated a little bit earlier today on some aspects of dental uh, care. Let me um, begin by uh, pointing out a couple of broad um, observations and then show where, uh, in my view, the dental profession uh, fits into that. And that is uh, as follows. As all of you know, we have a health system uh, in our country that's the most expensive in the world, uh, and the dollars keep rising. When I went to Washington in 1989, we were spending as a nation from both public and private sources $1 trillion for health care, consuming 11% of our GNP. Uh, today, uh, the latest figures are we spent some $2.4 trillion in 2010 in our health care system, which is now consuming 17% of our GNP. Well, when we look at our system, we find a couple of things. First, we do have strong educational systems uh, for our health professions. That was not always the case. Many of you know about the Flexner Report. We just celebrated the centennial of the Flexner Report last year. Uh, medical education and health professions education in general benefited from the re response to the Flexner Report so that we can say we have the strongest uh, trained, the strongest training programs for health professionals uh, in the world. You could also look at uh, our biomedical research enterprise. Following World War II with Vannevar Bush, who advised President Roosevelt, we, f we formed the National Institutes of Health. The National Institutes of Health, without question, is the world's premier biomedical research uh, support enterprise. And as a result of all of the uh, discoveries coming out of our laboratories and their translation into products and services, uh, during the course of the 20th century, we had more Nobel Prize winners who were scientists in American laboratories than in the rest of the world combined. Well, you would say, well, with all of the money we spend, we're number one. With a strong uh, health profession education system uh, where we have well-trained professionals, we have biomedical research, we should be the healthiest nation on earth. Well, as you know, we're not. And when we look at uh, our dental system, we find that uh, in spite of all of these things, that we have many problems. We have um, too many, it, as you know, we have dental caries as the number one chronic disease in children. We have um, uh, patients where there are no dental providers available, either because of geographic reasons, they are not there, or, as is the case too often, dentists don't accept Medicaid payment because they say the reimbursement levels are too low. So as a result of that, we have a lot of people who are not being served. And all of you know about uh, the unfortunate case of Diamante Driver uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, who died because he was refused care uh, because um, the dentist did not take uh, a Medicaid. 
that abscess erupted into the floor of the, of the brain, and he died uh, of meningi meningitis. And I'm told by my colleagues in, in the dental profession, Diamante Driver is not a unique case, that so this happens too often. Well, what do we do about that? And I maintain that the fact is we have, as a nation, limited dollars, that uh, I don't believe that we should be spending 17% of our GNP uh, on health care. I don't believe the answer is simply ratchet up Medicaid reimbursement rates. We need to find less expensive ways to provide health care. And in dentistry, developing uh, other kinds of providers, working under the leadership of dentists, I believe is a wise way to go. So that's why I think the concept of uh, dental therapists is a concept that really is a good one. It uh, deserves a, a, a fair chance. I went to Alaska, saw the program uh, up there. I was very impressed. Uh, the quality of the training of these young people, they're recruited out of their villages, uh, they're selected by committees in their villages, and they return to those villages uh, to provide uh, a care. But they work under the supervision uh, of, uh, of a dentist. Now my other comment uh, I would point out to all of you is this. What's, this question in dentistry is not a new question. We faced this question in medicine back in the 60s and the 70s when physicians assistants and nurse practitioners were developed as uh, mid-level providers to work with physicians to provide health care uh, for, uh, for patients. The AMA was adamantly opposed to it. There was many questions raised by physicians. The same kinds of things that are now being said in dentistry, well, aren't you providing second tier care for minority patients uh, or patients who are poor or in rural areas, et cetera? Well, if you go and see those patients who are taken care of by, in Alaska by those dental therapists, this is not second class care. The quality of care is just as good for their limited procedures that they do as the care given by dentists, and in some cases, seems to be even better. Dental therapists have been around the world for 90 years. Why haven't we as a country that, that prides itself on innovation, why is it that we really uh, are different from the other developed uh, nations? So I believe that uh, we really uh, owe our patients uh, the brains, the energy, the thoughts, the creativity to find ways to provide care to our citizens who, who don't need it, uh, who don't, who don't uh, get it. So, so that's really uh, the position uh, I take. And I really think a discussion like this really is a good one because I, I think there are legitimate concerns that dentists uh, have. I believe that with the Affordable Care Act, as you know, we're gonna bring 32 million more people into the system who are presently not insured. Who's going to take care of them? We certainly need more dentists, but that alone is not going to be enough. We cannot train enough dentists. It's too expensive, they're not there, so we need to find other providers to supplement the dental uh, services that dentists uh, provide. So that is really what I think needs to happen, and we'll have more to say later. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lou. So Tyrone, now your turn. Give us your sense of what your perspective is, that of the association, et cetera, on the role of non-dentist providers, uh, and indeed more of them now uh, potentially coming into healthcare delivery models across the country. Okay, let me start by saying muy buenas tardes, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. And uh, not that I want to play up the hat, but I wear many hats. And one of the hats that uh, I want to go ahead and share with you right now is as the president-elect for the Hispanic Dental Association, we're an association that is mission-driven. It's not member-driven. So when we look at what the needs are, we look at the needs for our community and what are the requirements to provide and optimize that community's oral health. I think that in the discussion of oral health, there's a big misnomer, and that is healthcare, since healthcare is really more of disease management, and that's what occurs in this country. When we look at the dental profession as far as dental school training, we see that a majority of dental school training involves managing a disease. And it's a deep concept, but if you look at the need out there is to how to change social behavior. When you go ahead and have children that I see as a pediatric dentist in my practice, you know, four-year-olds that are 100 pounds, 14-year-olds that are 465 pounds, 
there's something wrong that's going out there as far as diet nutrition. When you go ahead and look at the problem with the society, you also go ahead and look at, well, is it an access to care issue? Well, that might be a misnomer as well because it may also be a utilization of care issue. We try to encourage, for example, in my rural practice, patients to come in and sometimes we'll even offer them transportation and they just don't feel like coming in that day. The idea of the dental therapist is an interesting one, but I kind of look at it and our committee that went ahead and wrote our position paper looked at it and said, well, there's a lot of good ideas out there that are currently in practice. Why do we have to go ahead and modify dentistry even more? You know, does basketball need a second point guard? Do you have to add somebody new to the team? When we look at the dental profession in Washington, for example, this is a state that has many providers that have expanded roles within the dental team. We have, for example, a denturist. That is a great person in liaison that I rely on to treat some of my patients and refer them to that want to have dentures done. I know that some of my profs professors from dental school would go ahead and shudder that somebody else would be doing dentistry uh, for fabricating a denture that wasn't a dentist. But dentists do a wonderful job. I work with expanded function dental assistants. I work with expanded function dental hygienists. So in the state of Washington here, my hygienist can deliver anesthetic and my hygienist can restore teeth. I know in some states, because of the dental board, you know, that's something that folks would shudder at. How could somebody aside from a dentist deliver anesthetic or how could somebody aside from a dentist restore a tooth? But these providers have given care not only to my family, but even treated myself. So there is a workforce that's out there, but it's not a standardized workforce as each state has its own limitations and each type of region has its own needs. The idea of a dental therapist uh, coming into the mix is possibly a useful entity, but really is it something that needs to be ubiquitous? Is it a panacea in terms of the dental landscape? No, it is not. We have to be able to look at the dental profession and say, we have to think outside the box. Dentistry can't be an island anymore. I know with my community, I've worked very hard to establish relationships with physicians, with school nurses, with caseworkers, so that the community can receive the care and understand why it is they need to have the care. All too often, dentistry doesn't do a good enough job about educating the public, aside from go and see your dentist twice a year and make sure that you go ahead and get sealants on teeth. I think that the dental education uh, community needs to look at not just educating its professionals, but at helping people in the community understand why oral health is so important. If we look at going back to Dr. Satcher's report in 2000, we know the importance in the silent epidemic mindset of, you know, 51 million hours of school missed a year. And when people say, well, there's not enough providers out there, I think we have enough healthcare team members that need to be empowered. That's how the argument needs to go ahead and be looked at. And more importantly, we have an untapped resource. We have foreign trained dentists that need to be considered that are already dentists. They may need some fine tuning, they might be rough on the edges, but the reality it's a person that already has a skill set to work upon that can go ahead and be created to go ahead and be part of the access to care or the utilization of care issue. And then more importantly, the education that's needed amongst the health professions. You know, my esteemed colleague here, Dr. Sullivan, brought up an interesting point on one of our phone calls as to being unaware that dental caries was transmissible. If you have a policymaker at such a high level dictating and creating medical schools, medical schools go ahead and have maybe one day in their four years of training of exposure to oral health. There has to be a greater awareness amongst the health profession and the health community and when you have that team concept, costs come down, accountability goes up, and efficiency improves. So that's the point of view that we at the Hispanic Dental Association approach this, and I also approach it as a pediatric dentist, the only one in his county that sees not only uh, children, but special needs adults. So thank you again for having me here today. Great, well thanks, thank you. Thanks to both of you.
And just to summarize, uh, Lou, Dr. Sullivan, you said uh, for lots of reasons, the fact that healthcare in the US is so costly, uh, the fact that we have uh, lots of things that should predispose us to the best health care in the world uh, and the best health in the world, but we don't have those things. Uh, the fact that dental caries is the number one chronic disease in children, the fact that we have these great underserved areas of our country, uh, that dental therapists and other mid-level providers really represent a good concept and deserve a chance. You've seen the model at work, as you said, in Alaska, People are getting high quality care. Uh, those therapists are working under the supervision of physicians and in an environment of dentists rather, and in an environment where we're expanding coverage, why would we not make maximum use of that kind of model? Tyrone, you've made the point that we already have a lot of members of the dental health team broadly. Uh, maybe in not all states we, are we using them as effectively as apparently is the case here in Washington state, as you mentioned, with the use of everything from dentures to expanded function, dental hygienists, et cetera. Uh, you mentioned that dentistry can't be an island. It does need to link with other healthcare providers, but, uh, but possibly what it needs to do even more of is educate the public and other professionals about dent dentistry needs. Uh, and then make maximum use of the team members who we already have. So summing, using uh, those statements to sum up what you're saying, Dr. Sullivan, how would you respond to this notion that we already have, that Tyrone has advanced, that we already have lots of members of the team. We don't need to add any more. What we really need to do is make the best use of the team that's there. Well, I guess my response, uh, first of all, I think we all want the same objective. <clears throat> and uh, what I'm saying is, in spite of what we have now, we have dental caries, the most common chronic disease of children. We had almost 900,000 visits to emergency rooms that people had because of dental emergencies. Uh, and you look around uh, the, the country, the fact is, if we have all the people that we need, then why do we have the problems that we have? Secondly, I think Alaska has shown uh, very clearly uh, how to address the problem. In Alaska, they could not get dentists. They, they were not available. So what, what on the initiative of the Alaska Native population, they sent uh, their young people to New Zealand. They did, there was no such training program in the country because the American Dental Association and others said, we don't need this. Well, Alaska didn't buy that. They sent their young people away and then they developed the program subsequently that's now being uh, uh, operated uh, under the aegis of uh, University of Washington School of Medicine. These young people have been tested. The quality of care they give is excellent, just as good of, as that, uh, that a dentist gives. The number of procedures for which they are qualified are limited, but they are the common uh, procedures. So they now have young people who are now in the villages providing care that was not available uh, before uh, and improving uh, the, the status of oral health in these villages in, in Alaska. What I heard uh, from the people in Alaska was it was very common in these villages for young people to reach the age of 19 and 20, edentulous, or having full sets of artificial dentures. So uh, the reality is we have the problems. And what we have now uh, around the country is not addressing that problem. So if, the, if, the, if we have enough of what we need now, then why do we have the problems that we have now? So I, I think Alaska is a good example of success. It needs to be expanded. Uh, and the other point is we cannot, we certainly need more dentists. I, I certainly uh, 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 agree there. We need more physicians. We need more nurses because as we bring 32 million more people into the system, we're going to need uh, more of these. But in medicine, we indeed have incorporated physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, and they are working right alongside physicians in hospitals. I happen to be on the board of Grady Hospital, a large public hospital in Atlanta. We have physician's assistants, nurse practitioners in those practices. Uh, I had a hip replacement uh, uh, five years ago. When I went for my last annual uh, uh, checkup to my orthopedist, I didn't see the orthopedist. I saw his physician's assistant. He asked the right questions. 
He examined me. He did the x-rays. He, he interpreted that. I walked away very satisfied. Now, I happen to have been intimately involved in the healthcare system. And I think if I can be satisfied and feel that I'm getting good quality care by someone who's a mid-level provider, extending the capability of that orthopedist so he can see more patients and see it at less cost, I think, think that's a model that really should be adopted here in dentistry. So, so Tyrone, the question then back to you is, as Dr. Sullivan said, if we have all the people we need, why do we have these pervasive areas that are so underserved where uh, people cannot get access to dentists, where dentists won't accept or see, in many instances, Medicaid patients? Uh, why does that situation persist if we do have the people we need already in the profession? I think there's several facets that need to be looked at. Uh, I would dare to venture to say that there's probably decay still in Alaska. So it wasn't a cure. And more importantly, I think that as far as the system goes, we need to look at what components we can also look at in terms of social behavior. You know, what are we doing to educate the public when it comes to prevention? And I can tell you, you know, our office is right across the street from a high school. And I know it's very convenient for the high school students to go ahead and get, you know, a monster energy drink and a bag of chips, and they think that's an appropriate lunch. So when you have the environment where people don't take ownership or don't have an understanding of the impact of their decisions on their health, that's a big key that's not being looked at. The other issue, too, with, in terms of reducing costs, I know that everyone talks about reimbursement rates. And I think, once again, bringing back Washington into the picture, Washington's done a great example with the ABCD program, where you do have specific procedures in children that are reimbursed at a higher rate. Um, it's not a windfall by any means, but it allows the providers to go ahead and take care of those children, considering the burdens of care that are involved in the Medicaid system. The Medicaid system, if we uh, are familiar with that patient population, they have a usually higher than normal no-show rate. When we look at the Medicare system, uh, a lot of times when it comes to accountability, it seems to be a little bit lower and there's less concern for children. Uh, I hate to say it, but as a pediatric dentist, I'm one of the few dentists that I know of that had to send a mom to jail for 13 months because she would not take care of her special needs child and thought it was better to go ahead and get her fix on meth and do that over a period of 18 months while this child lost about 20% of their body weight. And if we hadn't have intervened, that social behavior wouldn't have changed. So I think that looking at reducing costs, there has to be incentives. Another issue that's happening very uh, awarely amongst circles of providers is as you speak around the country, uh, and speak uh, with providers around the country, you know that there's small little witch hunts going on for Medicare and Medicaid to try to recoup costs. So it's not uncommon of hearing stories where Medicaid will descend upon a practice and start auditing charts, look at those charts, and say 20% of those films that you took weren't diagnostic or you missed the apex on that PA, so now we want 20% of that money back over the last five years that you've charged us. So when you hear of those kinds of stories occurring, there's a disincentive to be involved in the system because it's more burdensome. One other thing about Medicaid too is the rules are constantly changing. I can tell you as a Medicaid provider, two years ago I could call up the services and I would be able to go ahead and get a report back on 10 patients. A year ago that was down to five patients. Last week I can get a call into Medicaid and ask about a patient and they give me 15 minutes or one patient, and then I've got to go on hold again for another 45 minutes to get a background check to find out if that person is eligible or if I can go ahead and pre-authorize the procedure that I'm going to provide on them. So when you look at the system and you look at access to care, once again, is the only burden a provider-based burden or limitation? No. I think that there's other aspects in terms of social behavior, in terms of the bureaucracy, perhaps, for lack of a better word, in terms of the Medicaid system and how it's set up. I think everyone in this room shares the common denominator. We want to help. We want to make the system better. But unfortunately, it's becoming a 
fee-for-service system, a encounter system, and not an outcome system. And I do know that the discussion is being made about considering what outcomes is. What is considered a healthy mouth and a healthy person? So uh, I think that that's some other aspects that we need to look at and not just solely rely on mid-level providers. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to ask uh, one more round of questions for these gentlemen, and then we are going to open it up to questions from the audience. And once again, please do uh, scrawl us a note with your question, and uh, those will be gotten forward to me, and we'll be able to address some of those with our panelists. So if I could put this in the language of economics, if you will, it sounds as if uh, we have uh, one of you, Dr. Sullivan, addressing the supply side, if you will, of the unmet burden, uh, the unmet dental need in this country. And you, you are saying, in effect, Tyrone, we've got to reduce the demand for that need. Uh, so let's explore that theme for just a moment. Uh, so we've got, as you've said, uh, Dr. Sullivan, this large unmet medical need posing great cost uh, on many of the, of the disadvantaged in our country, in particular children, et cetera. And we know in many instances predisposing a lot of them to a lifetime of other medical problems uh, as a consequence of their dental caries. So we've got that, and then we have Tyrone saying, well, the, we really have to reduce this demand for, health, for dental care by virtue of working on the social level, addressing these kinds of underlying uh, behaviors that are driving this dental need. So a question for both of you, I suppose, is are these phenomena mutually exclusive, or can both be worked on, and do both have to be worked on simultaneously? Is it one or the other? Well, no, I, I, I agree with her own uh, there, and, and I'm very strong on health education and prevention. I think we need that. We need that uh, in oral health, and we need that in health in general, because uh, that's one way to help address the escalation in costs. We need to find ways to really reduce the uh, slope, the upward slope of our health care expenditures, because as as in, 19, in the mid-1960s, we were spending 5.6% of GNP on health care. I mentioned when I went to Washington in 1989, it was 11%. Now it's 18%. In another uh, decade, it'll be close to 30%. That has consequences. That means there are less dollars available for education, for roads, uh, for housing, et cetera. Uh, so we can't... Uh, think that we're in an island as health professionals and that uh, the dollars are going to automatically flow to us. That's not going, going to happen. So we have to find ways to provide care more, expensive, more efficiently. So I, I certainly believe that patient education and prevention plays a very important role. That brings me back to dental therapists again. They are very good at patient education and prevention uh, because the dentist, as the physician, is often very busy doing very complicated uh, uh, procedures. If you have others in your team who can provide that education, who can provide the preventive services uh, at less cost, their training uh, is less, uh, a shorter period of time. So we should really be looking for ways that we can have personnel working with us who are not as costly. And that's really one of the advantages of dental therapists. The studies show the quality of care that they give is equal to that of dentists. You know, the same is in medicine. You know, again, years ago in medicine, we felt that a physician had to remove sutures. Well, guess what? That's not the case. You don't have to have someone who's a highly paid specialist really doing things like that. We have found in, in medicine, we have nurse midwives who do normal deliveries. Our obstetrician friends resisted that uh, tremendously with the same kinds of arguments. Well, experience has shown that the important thing is quality of outcome. And if quality of, quality of outcome is just as good, but you can deliver that quality at less cost, that's a logical economic model. So that's really, I think, what, what we're talking about here. So, we, let, so let's so. take that question back to Tyrone, because Tyrone, uh, you, you're obviously a, a terrific dentist. Do we want to invest in you and your education to have you be the person sitting with patients and counseling them on brushing their teeth? Or should we have somebody who is able to work at the top of his or her license, having been trained as a therapist, 
taking on more of that role. The studies do indicate that peer level education in healthcare often is the most effective education. Is that not a potentially a role? I already have that. I have that through my expanded function dental assistants. I have that through my expanded function hygienists. So why do I have to go ahead and why do I have to go ahead and add somebody else, kind of like a, you know a, a chaperone on a date? You don't want there. The, the, the whole idea is that we have the team. The team has already been put together, but the team needs to go ahead and work and integrate better. I think that's the whole thing that, uh, based on where you're trained, you may have a limited exposure or you may have a very extensive exposure. Uh, another thing that I think that hasn't been addressed that's actually very powerful, and uh, anybody here from Arizona, AT Stills, are you in the house? Okay, good. The whole idea is that they grasp a very important concept. If you train providers in rural communities they will go back to those rural communities. I've seen it. You know, being involved with two residency programs in central Washington, and we had graduates from Arizona come up, they've stayed. They've stayed in these underserved communities. And I can remember in central Washington when there was a handful of pediatric dentists for six or seven counties, now we have pediatric dentists and we also have, you know, uh, folks that came up for an AGD program that are disseminated all over the, the community and they've stayed in these underserved areas. I think that the other uh, important idea to understand is that you know, uh, dentistry needs to go ahead and show and give the tools of their, gra give their graduates tools so that they feel comfortable in these settings. You know, many times, unfortunately, the geographic location or barrier is that dental schools are in big cities and they, not always take advantage of farming people out and getting them out there sooner and for longer periods of time into these rural settings so they, they can kind of envision, hey, I really like this community or I could see relocating my family here or you know what, maybe there's the possibility for loan repayment so that I can try to go ahead and be part of that safety net as a, a practitioner. While we're waiting for perhaps uh, some questions to come forward, uh, let me ask you both to focus on uh, the part of today's discussion that comes after the colon. That is to say, the first part is uh, new delivery models. Second part is what is the role of the educational enterprise in this discussion now? What would be your thoughts, Dr. Sullivan, on what that role? What should these folks be thinking about as they think about shaping uh, a new healthcare workforce? Well, if, if I understand the thrust of your question, um, what I'm saying is this, we have a, we're relying on a system of training dental professionals that is not providing the, all of the services that, that we need at the cost that we can afford. And what uh, mid-level providers uh, give us, and it's not, certainly not the total answer, because certainly I agree um, uh, with the very good point that Tyrone made. We certainly need to have better health education, including dental uh, uh, education, better preventive services. Uh, but uh, we need to have a system that is affordable, and, and we don't have to in, uh, reinvent the wheel. We have a system that exists in England, in New Zealand, in Australia, and elsewhere, where the cost of dental services can be half as much uh, uh, because of the use of mid-level uh, providers. So we, so we need to uh, look at ways that we can provide services to all of our citizens, which is not the case now, at a, at a price that, that we can afford. So, so we need to do all of these things. We certainly uh, want to continue to have well so sophisticated dentists who can do complex things, we need that and we want it. But we also need to have providers who could give us care at, at less cost if we are to have a system that's going to, to survive economically. Great. Well, as you can see, quite a few questions did come forward, so we're going to try to get through several of them uh, in the time we have before we bring on our respondents. So here's a question uh, from one member of the audience. Is there an access to care problem or an access to free care problem? 
Do mid-level providers charge less or get reimbursed at lower rates? Can you require mid-level providers to restrict their practice to underserved areas to address this problem? Uh, Dr. Sullivan, let's start with you, and then Dr. Rodriguez, well, I'd like to hear you comment as well. I, I think the latter part of uh, your question is very difficult. Uh, certainly, the greatest need is in medically underserved areas, rural areas, poor communities, et cetera. And that's where we would hope that uh, and, and try and orient uh, our trainees uh, to settle. But I think uh, the idea of restricting uh, them to a geographic area, that gets into all kinds of, kinds of political problems. Now, there are in medicine, and certainly I'm sure there are models in dentistry, of really providing economic uh, aid, and this is what happens in Alaska. These young people uh, have the cost of their education paid for uh, by the Native American uh, uh, health uh, system, but they commit themselves to returning to their communities and, and establishing their practices there, and it's working. So that's an agreement that these young people enter into uh, with their villages. So I think that uh, that uh, certainly is something that I think is feasible, but to have legislation to try and do that, I think that would be problematic. Thank you, Luke. Tyrone. And you know, I've seen the providers that train in the rural communities as residents or as dental students stay in those communities. So it's not an issue of just the mid-level provider that works at, that works at in a lot of different types of professional settings. And I do think that there is a culture that likes to get things for free. I have uh, several assistants that are great young ladies. They're single mothers in some instances, and they work very hard. We try to provide them with a, a decent wage, and sometimes they can understand how some people use the system of entitlements and you know, drive a better car, have the newest cell phone, and yet they are quote unquote poor uh, if they're making their financial decisions to obtain these types of uh, what would be considered luxury items. So is it better, you know, around Christmas time to have a crown and keep that tooth, or is it better to go ahead and get a 55 inch plasma TV? Okay, well, the, um Let's move on to a next uh, couple of questions, and I, I'm going to pick two here that are, are uh, somewhat so linked. Could, could, yep. could, if I, let me, I really have to make a comment here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. And that is this. I think to have the attitude that poor people are trying to game the system and get something for nothing, that is not fair to them. No. I'm not, no. I'm not generalizing. I haven't finished. I'm not generalizing. Welfare reform in 96 showed uh, that if you give people help and getting a job, uh, that they indeed will come off of, of welfare if they have those opportunities. We're not talking, at least I'm not talking about providing something to people uh, with an entitlement uh, mentality. We want to help people who have health problems and I think that means that we have to be flexible and do everything we can and not simply assume that uh, everyone who's really re receiving care at no cost is, really has an entitlement mentality. I don't think that we, that has to enter the question. My, my intention wasn't to make it a blanket statement and I can tell you from my family, pardon me, and me personally, I've been on welfare. I know what it's like, for example, to have my wife who's sitting in the audience go through 18 hours of labor have an emergency C-section and be a college student and not be able to afford it. But I do know that there are people out there that take advantage of the system. There are wealthy people out there who take advantage of the system exactly. too. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, okay. and, and, why, and, why is this reminding yeah. me of last year and uh, of the November <laughs> elections? Let's, if we could, move on uh, just to a couple of uh, questions that I mentioned were linked. Uh, this is a question about uh, what evidence is there to show that mid-level providers low, lower dental care costs is the first question. Uh, and a linked question is, uh, and this questioner comments first and says both concepts are smart uh, to move forward with, I think if this means new delivery uh, models and to also at the same time ac uh, address access issues. So let's go, says this questioner. The questioner is, Describe the benefit and the role of dental and dental hygiene education schools 
in moving forward to address the healthcare delivery system. So back to the role of the educational system. So let's take that first one first. What evidence is there to show that mid-level providers lower dental care costs? Well, I'd like to start with the, uh, the whole idea of the uh, dental hygienist and being a, an integral part of the solution. Um, I understand and I know because I work with CRNAs when I'm doing anesthesia on patients. Uh, I do work with nurse practitioners to get clearance for my patients. My family actually is treated by a nurse practitioner. But they all started as nurses and then they built upon that foundation as a nurse to be able to provide these expanded services. So if we already have hygienists out there, and I know that I probably get one or two resumes a week for hygienists that are looking for work, they're a great foundation to go ahead and give this skill set to, to be able to expand on to be part of the team, but they're already in the team. It's not a separate entity, nor is it somebody that you're creating, nor is it somebody that you're creating to try to reinvent a whole new type of program and structure. This is a professional that already has an understanding of what the needs are for the health profession. Well, ju just on that point, let me introduce another part of another quick question, because I am trying to get as many of these in as possible. One other questioner writes, what about an advanced practice dental hygienist? Would there be a role for that uh, type of a, of a professional role? I think when you're looking at uh, if anybody and the need is there to step into that role, uh, I could definitely see the value in an expanded function, advanced, whatever title it wants to be given, uh, as far as uh, position, uh, that it would build upon the hygiene framework. Because the hygienist is familiar with what the needs are in terms of the dental team. And I think another thing that's also very important too, to expand that hasn't been addressed upon is the technology we have available. You know, many times, if I'm not uh, in my uh, office in Moses Lake, uh, I have another satellite office that's two and a half hours away in OMAC. I can go ahead and Skype. I can go ahead and have radiographs sent to me, or I can FaceTime, and I can talk to the provider that's up there, and they can relay information back and forth to me so that we can go ahead and use my training and my skill set more efficiently. So I think it's not about working harder with creating a new practitioner. I think it's about working smarter. Dr. Sullivan. Yes, uh, I comment on the question of what is the evidence that dental therapists lower the cost of care. The evidence uh, cited by Dr. David Nash in the review of the world's literature on dental therapists, and specifically in New Zealand, he found that uh, dental uh, care provided uh, by dental therapists was half as costly as that provided by dentists with no greater increase in, in quality. The program uh, here in Alaska hasn't been there long enough to do the data here because the program started in 2005 and the numbers are, are still small, but as, there's every reason to expect that the cost would be lower. And if we are smart in embracing this model and designing it uh, so that it develops the way it should, I think we would expect that the cost uh, would be lower. All right, uh, Tyrone, here, this is a question uh, directed to you. Uh, why can't all states have uh, the expanded uh, uh, model of dental hygienists like Washington State? The fact of the matter is they don't. And this questioner is saying, this is what the term dental therapist is asking for. It's asking for a role in the states where scope of practice really has been so restricted. I think that's out of the hands of the uh, educators, I think it's out of the hands of the providers. That's really a self-reflection of the state and their dental practice acts. And until something is voiced uh, at a national level, that step won't go ahead and happen. I think it takes the associations, I think it takes the educators, I think it takes the practitioners going to their state boards and saying, okay, it was run this way this long, it's not working, something has to change. And Dr. Sullivan, I believe this is the same questioner who wanted uh, equal time, so addressed a question to you as well, uh, saying you make the analogy between nurse practitioners and potential new oral health uh, workforce models. 
nurse practitioners, this questioner notes, require considerable education. Uh, shouldn't there be equally high standards applied to the training of new oral health professionals? Shouldn't their training and education well, certification <clears throat> standards also be very sure. strict? Well, my response there is, what have we seen in Alaska? These are young people who, first of all, are high school graduates who have 24 months of training, 3,000 hours uh, of clinical services, and by examinations by dentists, uh, they have found that the quality of care for the procedures for which they are certified is equal to that of dentists. If that's the case, why do we need to have, have something different? What we're trying to find are new ways of providing care at less cost. So uh, if there were problems with the quality of care or the rate of complications, et cetera, there could be a justification for changing the standards. But the program in Alaska has uh, thus far shown that it is providing quality of care that is equal to, and in some cases better than that, provided by dentists for the procedures for which they're certified. If we have that, why do we need to build in more? That builds in more costs, uh, so I, I think it's not necessary. All right, well, let's take one last question from the audience before we uh, turn to our responders who we will bring up on stage at that point. This questioner writes, uh, this is really a siloed discussion. Uh, this discussion of mid-level providers, the advantages, the, uh, the uh, detriments, et cetera, that's valid. But what concerns me as a physician, this questioner writes, who has been involved in health policy, is that really the broader question here is how the oral health workforce is going to interface with the evolving healthcare system in, for example, the patient-centered medical home. That this is just not on the table for most of dentistry. And the future model of healthcare, this questioner writes, really should drive the dental workforce into it and have the, by extension, I think the questioner is saying, the kinds types of providers that you will need in the team of the patient-centered medical home, much along the lines of the rest of the team in the patient-centered medical home. So, Tyrone, would you start with that? I think it's a very valid point, but once again, I get back to the state of Washington, I just happen to be a fan, is we go ahead and look at, are there also, uh, uh, is there a fee structure that reimburses primary health providers to go ahead and do a limited exam? Yes. Is there also primary health providers that aren't dentists that can go ahead and apply fluoride varnish? Yes. Um, many times we have set up within our communities, and it just depends, but it needs to be replicated at a bigger level, that if a patient's in my chair and they keep getting a, a continuously a high reading on their blood pressure, I may want to go ahead and refer them to that physician to go ahead and evaluate for hypertension. Or perhaps they're in the chair and they don't know uh, today's uh, blood sugar is 300 and their A1C value is you know, 10, 12. And those are the kinds of things where, as a profession, we need to look at and say uh, more needs to happen early on with integrating uh, nursing students, medical students, dental students, and having an appreciation for what these groups do. And, you know, it wasn't something that I came across extensively until I got involved into a residency. Then I had a better understanding of what it was that these other groups went ahead and did. But I think that that is one area that needs to go ahead and address the, the problem, is that this is a problem that is multi-professional, it's cross-curricular and interdisciplinary, and it's not just about dentists anymore, it's about the whole health team and creating, uh, some uh, folks uh, call it the medical home, and we have some associations that call it the dental home. So, Dr. Sullivan, let's... I, I fully agree uh, uh, there. We certainly um, uh, need to have really more uh, interdisciplinary uh, interactions and we are seeing it in our uh, health professions educational programs. We, we do have programs where there are nursing students training with medical students or with dental students and with other uh, members of the team, physical therapists, et cetera, because the field of the health professions have become complex. One of the things that's happened as we have developed more sophisticated therapies uh, and, 
and have been able to um, address uh, many medical needs, it really has led to having a number of different kinds of professionals. So I certainly agree we need to find ways to integrate them more uh, uh, effectively. Let me give one other example of um, uh, giving good quality care at, at less cost in medicine. In Washington, D.C., we have the highest infant mortality rate of any city in the country, and that's really uh, remarkable, our nation's capital. In Northeast Washington, there was a shortage of obstetricians. Well, we had a nurse midwife who set up a clinic there. She happened to be a MacArthur fellow, but she has set up a clinic there about 15 years ago. And what uh, is now existing there, where this was really the worst area in Washington, and they have really set up uh, uh, home delivery or uh, delivery systems right in the birthing center there, uh, these uh, uh, pregnant mothers who come there have a lower incidence of preterm births, uh, the infant mortality rate there is lower, and the cost of care uh, for those uh, mothers in that center is less than that of the typical obstetrical uh, care. So that, that's one example of providing high quality care at less cost in an area where it's needed, uh, and that's really the model that I think that we need to look at for dentistry and the, and the rest of, of medicine. We don't have to continue into the 21st century with 19th century models of care. We need to adopt to the new reality. All right, well, thank you. Thank you both. As you could see, we could have gone on a lot longer with the audience questions. Uh, we will continue the discussion, though, now by bringing up onto the stage our three responders. And I do have the pleasure of introducing them as they join us here on the stage. First of us, uh, first of all, rather, with us is Phyllis Beamsterboer, who's professor and associate dean for academic affairs at the Oregon Health and Science University. She's also an associate director in the Center for Ethics in Healthcare at OHSU, and that really is her role today on the panel to bring to bear the ethical perspective on these discussions. So, Phyllis, welcome. We're also delighted to have with us Ken Randall, who's uh, uh, bringing to bear uh, the uh, new entry entrant into uh, this field perspective today. He's a resident in the general practice residency at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, having graduated <coughs> last May from the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry. So welcome, Ken. We'll look forward to hearing your perspective. And then finally with us is Bob Russell, who serves as public health dental director of the Iowa Department of Public Health where his many accomplish, uh, accomplishments include publishing a dental training manual for federally qualified health centers and also developing a statewide care coordination and promotions campaign, preparing dental hygienists to increase access to oral health care. And he received his dental training at Loyola University of Chicago. So welcome to all three of you. I'd just like to uh, take a moment I'd like to take a moment to ask each of you to start us off with some reactions to the discussion that we've just heard, a sort of top line response. And Phyllis, let's start with you from the ethical perspective. What, what, uh, what, what came out, what spoke to you? Well, I think it's, it's fabulous that we have this opportunity to have this discussion and both the views of the two um, reactors and talking about how they're, what they're coming from and what they're bringing to the discussion and how complex this issue is and how complex any solutions that we eventually arrive at are going to be. You know, the question at hand is what is the role of dental education? And the role of dental education in this, it's, it's not even just a responsibility, it's an obligation. It's an obligation we have as a profession where we publicly state we are advocating for the needs and interests of the people we serve. So we cannot sit back. We have to be part of this. Not, and not only that, but our dental institutions, as both Lou and Tyrone have referred to, were perfectly situated to be that experiment, to be that place where we can um, implement, evaluate, monitor these programs to find out what is a solution or a multitude of solutions to the growing problems that we have that have been articulated so well. Things like the Minnesota uh, 
projects, the other places like in Alaska. There may be solutions that we don't even know. We know we can do training. We know we can build on that training. Look at what we've done. Go back even to um, the Forsyth experiments in the 60s and 70s, the expanding of duties and training hygienists and assistants to do these things. We know we have these abilities. We know we can do, we have to do it in a way that's effective and efficient so that we don't lose that perspective. So we're, we're truly treating the patients and the people who are seeking and needing the care. That's our ethical responsibility. Ken, I'm gonna skip over you for just a moment because I do, I wanna ask Bob uh, the same uh, set of questions and particularly as, as Phyllis picked up on, the role of the educational enterprise in this. Uh, what is your, what were your reactions to the earlier discussion and how would you help all of these folks think through the role of, of education? <clears throat> One thing I can say, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Sullivan both, in my opinion, made one point that was about the same, that we're not doing enough with our workforce delivery system at this point in time. Not only those that are existing, but at the same time, if we did create new workforce models, would we even use them correctly? when we don't have much of a track record of using the ones we have now very well. <laughs> but I can say, uh, working with safety net systems, one thing I've always found kind of interesting, and in fairly qualified health centers and those of that like, many dentists feel a little bit strained that they're working with populations and doing procedures that don't use but maybe a third of their training. And for that reason, few find great satisfaction working that delivery system. And they oftentimes leave to go into other places to get a, a more broader use of that broad-based training that dentists actually acquire. And for that reason, uh, the thought of a more limited model professional is intriguing. I have to admit, from, one, from that perspective, at the same time, the cost of federally qualified health centers and safety net delivery systems continue to accelerate as well, not just the private practice models. Uh, it's getting to the point where it's, I don't know if many people understand that fairly qualified health centers have to see patients regardless of their ability to pay. But that is not necessarily true today. And because as we continue to emerge, the cost of running these centers continue to accelerate to such a point that literally they have to make a profit. They have to make some money. And therefore, they're driven to do things that in the past probably wasn't as great a demand. So they're looking for ways to lower that ceiling. And one of the ways to lower that ceiling is to provide services uh, at a cheaper rate. And I can say, if we have hygienists, assistants, or therapists, or whatever model that evolves out that can provide services at a less costly rate, but we can see more people and provide a greater coverage, I think it's going to be very appealing to the future. Ken, as somebody who's coming into the prof dentistry profession now, what was your reaction to the conversation? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, certainly everybody here has made some incredibly uh, valid points. And I think that one thing we've consistently heard uh, with everybody is efficiency. And uh, I think also, uh, I was sitting there uh, watching uh, the proceedings earlier, and the logo right there between Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Rodriguez uh, has a couple words on it that I thought were particularly meaningful and particularly uh, insightful for a idea to have moving forward, uh, interprofessional education. And I think that's really where we're going to see this uh, model that's more prevention-based uh, come to take shape. And that idea of interprofessional education, yes, it relates to uh, educating our physician colleagues, our nurse colleagues, our pharmacy colleagues, uh, but I think also it relates to looking within dentistry. Uh, there currently is no CODA requirement to have dental students learn how to interact with dental hygienists or how to interact with dental assistants. There's no hygiene standard on how to work with dentists. And so I think that there's a lot of inefficiency uh, built into our current model of education that we can continue to improve upon and we're seeing some schools around the country that really are improving upon that. Uh, I know that, for example, in my education, I uh, graduated last May, uh, I didn't do a hygiene check until I was out of school. Uh, is that school's fault? 
No, not necessarily, but at the same time, I think that being better educated on how we can work within that existing framework uh, is going to make us a lot more efficient uh, down the road when we do get out into uh, other settings outside of academia. Uh, I guess also touching on interacting with our colleagues in medicine and pharmacy, uh, my GPR year this year has been really insightful into investigating how medicine and dentistry and all of the other healthcare professions uh, interact. And we, we spent a little bit of time on uh, an emergency medicine rotation. And despite all of the healthcare providers that we have in medicine these days, two thirds of the people that came to the emergency room were still there for primary care reasons. We still were, were not being efficient in our delivery of medicine. We talk about how we continue to have more and more providers in medicine, yet our costs are continuing to go up. Something's got to change there. And it's more of an efficiency-based model. It's not a provider model that's going to solve this issue. Um, and then finally, one other point that I'd like to make is uh, in regards to our pharmacy colleagues. Uh, wouldn't it be great if when somebody comes to the uh, pharmacy, and says, you know, I'm looking for the Origel, I've got a toothache. Wouldn't it be great if they could refer them to a dentist instead of aisle three? Great. Great. So, we, so we've just heard, uh, to paraphrase some of these points, uh, as Phyllis put it, uh, that de the dental educational enterprise has an obligation to advocate, first of all, on behalf of patients and better care, and therefore cannot sit this debate out, has to respond, has to be at the table uh, watching the new models unfold, helping to implement them, helping to evaluate them, monitor them, get the evidence, take it back to the profession and integrate it into uh, what will come next. So we heard that perspective loud and clear. Uh, Bob, as you shared with us, we're, by the way, probably not doing enough with the workforce we already have. Uh, so as we think through these new models, having everybody work, uh, if you will, to the top of uh, his or her license and really address some of the issues we've been talking about becomes important. And then Ken has just shared with us interprofessional education, obviously being another core responsibility of the, of the educational sector here. So let me move on to ask you all, are there, is there room for different points of view within uh, dental education based on differences in mission, differences of geographic location of each institution, the fact that some institutions are in states with large numbers of underserved populations and vast expanses of underserved rural areas, uh, versus other states, uh, much more uh, urban focused, et cetera. Is there room for some diversity of perspective here approaching these new models and the role of education in them? So, uh, Tyra. I, I think there's a joke out there that if you have 10 dentists look at the same patient, you'll get 13 different treatment plans. Um, the idea behind how each dentist feels that it's their best way to solve the problem is still open, so we need to do a better job at creating best practices. You know, what's the best way to go ahead and do a specific procedure and standardize that? That will reduce costs. I think another issue that's important to go ahead and look at when it comes to the, uh, the dental profession is, yeah, the realization that, you know, uh, the educational environment has to prepare its graduates for the area and the region that they're going in. You know, I never would have thought, having trained in Texas, that I would have to brush up on Ukrainian and Russian, dobre udro, das vidanya, and understand that my Russian and Excellent. Ukrainian uh, patients um, didn't want a lot of radiation or were fearful of x-rays because of their background in Chernobyl. Uh, understand that, you know, they didn't want more than one carpool of anesthetic because in their culture, you know, you've got to be strong and tough. So. One also important aspect in dental training that has to be brought to light is cultural competency. Is the school preparing that provider for that population? Well, what, what about this question of the diversity of perspectives? Uh, is oh, yes, there room I, for that? I think there's really every reason to have diverse appro approaches in dental education. We have that in medicine. 
Uh, we have um, some medical schools that are research intensive schools. Their main mission is new discovery. And we need those schools. But at the same time, we have a need for more primary care physicians. There are medical schools that really are focusing on training more primary care uh, uh, physicians. We have uh, some medical schools that are very good in training people for the field of pediatrics or obstetrics or what have you. Uh, and so certainly there's that need for, for diversity. And things have changed in medicine dramatically. When I went to medical school, uh, I think around 3% of the medical students were women. But today, 51% of medical students uh, are, are women. So we've seen changes in the makeup of our classes, as well as we've seen changes in technology and new uh, drugs, et, et, et cetera. So no, I, I think that we need to have a number of different approaches to really find out over time which ones work. And ones that work in one area may not work as well in another area. So I think that uh, diverse approaches really uh, would be very helpful in getting uh, the right answer. Bob, let me jump to you uh, on this notion of diversity of perspectives within the educational enterprise on these questions. <clears throat> At the core of our training as dentists, we are first scientists. And one thing about being a scientist is being curious about things that could be, not just what are, but exist. I feel like what has happened a lot is a lot of anger and a lot of frustration has been expressed about something we don't even know if it works or doesn't. I mean, we lack data to truly know for certain whether or not it's going to be successful here or there. And the lack of data is really a lack of data. It means we don't know. And so to have a definitive decision on something you don't know is not scientific. So I feel we have to be open to new innovations. I don't believe, like for example, Tyrone and Lewis, uh, their statements are both correct. In other words, Everything you said about the current workforce is correct. We don't use them correctly. Everything you said about the need for less cost in the future in order to provide care for more, that's true too. The reality is there's no one solution. There is no one, should we say, it's not like we're carpenters on a hammer and the only thing we need is a nail. It's literally, there are multiple ways this access to care, this, this quality care initiative will have to take. Whether there will be multiple tools, maybe mid-levels will play a role, there will be other levels, behavioral health, more diversity and utilizing of workforce. I think there's a room for all of these different things and with the points of views as well. Okay. Ken, I want to come to you quickly on this question of diversity of perspectives. If you uh, uh, were going through uh, your dentistry education all over again, uh, would you, what would you want to be doing in terms of going to a school that is testing out some of these new models uh, versus uh, saying, no, Katie, bar the door, the way we've got it done now is, uh, is perfect? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it is certainly appropriate for schools to have different, different areas of emphasis in their mission. Um, public schools inherently uh, tend to have a mission to uh, train dentists for their, their state. That's why they get their state funding and private schools uh, have a little bit more leeway in what they design their mission to be. Uh, fundamentally though, that mission is still to advance the profession and to, to take care of the public's dental needs. Um, as well, what we're starting to see is taking care or being able to refer patients appropriately to address other needs outside of dentistry and really integrating uh, the system together. Um, I, I think that there's no one dental school that can accomplish all of that uh, just inherently in, in the, the nature of the, uh, the faculty shortages that we continue to have and, and the funding shortages that we're seeing. Um, they, in some ways, you kind of have to pick and choose your battles. Um, but I think that that fundamental premise of, of advancing the profession and taking care of patients uh, certainly still applies. Uh, I, I don't know that exploring something that we, uh, that isn't shown to be efficient yet without first correcting what we currently have in our education system is appropriate at this time. 
All right, well, Phyllis, as the uh, ethicist on the panel, uh, we're going to give you the chance to give the benediction, if you will, uh, on this conversation. So is it ethically sound, in a way, to test out these various approaches and, and address, as, as uh, Bob Russell said, this notion that we really don't know enough. We really have to uh, study, uh, act, uh, learn, educate ourselves and move forward. It, it, how, how do we think about this in an ethical perspective? You know, what we're trying to do here is to honor our societal contract, honor our values, compassion, justice. But in that same framework, we also have beneficence and non-maleficence. And so clearly, anything we do, anything, any architecture we create, we have to do it with a mind of how we can do that in an experimental framework that protects and honors those, those core values. So yes, I think we can do that. In fact, we've done that in the past. We've had experimental programs that have gone into different areas and looked at how we can target those areas and, and honor what we need to do to um, provide that good data. We haven't done such a good job in coming up with data, which is why we, we don't have any outcomes. We can't prove anything. We need to do that, and our educational dental ins institutions are perfectly situated for this. We're mostly in academic health centers. We have our other professions. We can start to begin all, all these uh, interprofessional education discussions. Um, it takes work. It takes time. And I look around the room and I see people who have made some serious and significant efforts in these arenas and will acknowledge it takes a long time to get this right. And we, but we can't abdicate our job there. We have that responsibility to foster the innovation, to foster the, uh, and, but keeping in mind that we have to protect the public we're serving and look for those solutions. But we are, the Educational Dental Institution is the place that this can happen. We are the architects that can make this. And as you said uh, so memorably a few moments ago, we really cannot sit back uh, and wait this out. We have to respond as educational organizations. Well, with that marvelous benediction, uh, uh, to evoke uh, the phrase that uh, Dr. Russell used, uh, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I unfortunately have a hammer, and I have to hammer this wonderful discussion to a close. So join me in thanking the, this group for a terrific discussion. And turn things back over yes. to Jerry. I've been asked to provide a summary of this important topic. I will not be able to do that for many, many reasons. I think the bottom line is we listen to the discussions here this afternoon, and not just a very hot topic, but a very critical topic. I believe as educators, we must be myopic. We must not be myopic. We must keep on learning, lifelong learning, and really understand all the complexities associated with this issue. Because the bottom line is, is our patients, and making sure that they get quality care and are able to receive care. That's my bottom line. The other issue, I want to thank all our speakers. They have very strong passions, as you saw this afternoon. And I want to thank all of them personally. They deserve a round of applause. OK, so because the panelists were only able to answer a few questions, and many of you have your own thoughts and opinions that you want to share with each other, you, we invite all of you to continue the discussion at 3 p.m. These round tables in front of you uh, were set up so that ADEA members can talk with each of you, each amongst themselves, about the topic. There are questions at each table, so uh, if you'd like to use them to begin a discussion, that's fine, or start sharing your ideas at the table. So this will take place from 3 to 3.30, and please join your colleagues up front. Again, thank you very much for the, your attendance. Obviously, a uh, well-packed audience here, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you.